Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here in theme 15, Geochemistry and Society. I'm going to focus on environmental impact of volcanic eruptions and how we uh, interact with civil uh, protection. And I'm going to give you an example from Iceland, but I'm going to uh, so I'm going to step out of the ring of fire here, but spiritually we are all here located now in, in Hawaii. Now Iceland is located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and it's very strategically uh, located in the North Atlantic in terms of impact in Europe. The prevailing jet stream can just in one day bring volcanic gas and SO2 plumes uh, directly into, into Europe. Now, this is Iceland, and there is over, over um, 30 uh, active volcanoes located there, and uh, erupting every, every five years. In terms of um, natural hazards, there is like a three hazards. There is a volcanic ash, a magmatic ash coated with uh, uh, soluble uh, salts, metal salts that can pollute the environment. And of course, the volcanic ash can impact the um, impact the uh, air traffic. And a good example of this is the Hecla volcano that erupted in 1970, um, 1980, 1991, and 2000. And all these eruptions are explosive and uh, distributing volcanic gas very rapidly, always during the first two hours of the eruption. And this can have a huge impact on, on the environment. Now we have volcanoes like Eyjafjallajökull, Katla and Grímsvatn all located under glaciers and they are all explosive and um, forming what we call hydromagmatic ash, uh, ash that has gone through water phase or glacier and it is not as polluted as the uh, magmatic ash both from uh, Hekla and also at late stage Eyjafjallajökull but they can cause major danger uh, to air traffic and also uh, it causes some effect of, uh, of the environment, especially if it's, it's a large uh, ash production. But also in the very beginning when they start and, and when the eruption is working its way through the glacier, there can be humongous flood. And I worked on one of them in, uh, in 1996 from the Gjalp eruption here where the flood here in the, in the, during the first 24 hours, it was the second largest river on earth for a while. So, and, and this one is the largest one last century in the, in the Katla, following the Katla eruption in 1918. And this one was the largest river on earth, you know, larger than the Amazon. It's estimated that the flood here was 300,000 cubic meters per second. And um, posing uh, threats to to humans here, and, and among the people that nearly died there was my grandfather that galloped on his horse in front of the of the flood. Now the um, last, and uh, not the least, uh, threat from um, volcanic eruptions are large effusive eruptions like the Lucky Fire here uh, that uh, took place in, um, in 1783 to 1784, emitting over 100 uh, million tons of SO2 affecting the local population drastically here and, and also people in Europe and, and because of the SO2 fuel that made it all the way to Europe. Because of Lackey fire, you know, 60% of the grazing stock in Iceland and indirectly and directly the human population shrunk um, by 20%. So it had a huge impact on, on the local environment. So we're talking about uh, really polluted, polluting volcanic ash that can affect grazing stock and humans and aquatic life. Then we're talking about hydromagmatic ash that is not as polluted as the magmatic one. But that one can affect air traffic in Europe because of, depending on the size and, and, and because of the prevailing jet stream that brings the ash into Europe. And then we have uh, the floods and the large effusive, effusive, uh, effusive uh, eruptions. Uh, now I'm going to spend the rest of this talk to talk about the Eyjafjallajökull uh, summit uh, eruption. It started um, 14th of April 
and lasted till 23rd of May, and it worked its way th up through 100 to 300 meter thick glacier. The volcanic plume reached mainland Europe 15th of April, and the airspace was uh, closed um, the beginning of that day in all of Europe. Well, not all of Europe, but large part of Western Europe. There was a vigorous ice melting and ensuing floods during 14th and 15th of April. And there was intensive hydromagmatic interaction during the first days of the eruption. Um, what you can see here that the this picture shows is taken 1520, you know, in the afternoon. And you can see that the volcano is covered with clouds, but the volcanic cloud is working its way through the cloud cover and it's heading for and the plume is heading for Europe. And you can see already there is a coarse grained volcanic ash here raining out of the plume. Um, the, um, now, this picture of the plume is taken three days later, where you have the summit here, and, and then, you know, there's this really forceful plume going out here towards UK. Uh, the temperature of the plume here by the crater is, is about 1000 degrees C, but once it's up here at 10 kilometer height, it's about minus 5 degrees, 50 degrees Celsius. So this is a condensation column where, uh, where uh, acids and metal fumes condense on the surface of the ash and form water-soluble salts that they can then, once they fall back into the ocean, they can fertilize the ocean or they can pollute and or fertilize the, the environment. And I took this at the at the same time, and, and what you can see here is the the bottom of the plume. Here is the glacier covered with black volcanic ash, and here is some. There's a strong wind here, and some of the ash is resuspended re here. But what's important here? We can see the meltwater. We can see the water here, and the hydromagmatic affected ash here at at at, at this stage. And, uh, and so it's a proof of the meltwater, and, and this caused extra fragmentation and co producing extremely fine-grained uh, ash. Now, uh, after we had sampled the flood the 14th of uh, April, we were around midnight, we were asked to go the day after and actually towards the plume and take a sample um, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, grain size analysis. And we are heading here into the plume and, um, and um, for sampling. And we sample at the, at the edge of the plume. We have just finished sampling when this picture is taken. And then we're heading in, into the plume. And um, I'm going to show you. A... Now, this is a video of, the, of us driving into the plume. And this is color video, fast forward the color video. But of course, everything is black and white. And as we get further into the plume, you can see the head beam of the car is getting more and more conspicuous. And then once we get in the middle of the plume and we got out of the car, it was amazing to see that, you know, everything is, is just like a flower moving around us while we are there. Now, the wind was blowing from south to north and moving the plume northward of us. So now we're driving through it again and you can see how it's getting darker and darker and then we move fast through it and we get, uh, get uh, out of it and the light is, is getting more and more, uh, more uh, uh, well, we're getting more and more light. And, uh, and this is me here taking the sample in the middle of the plume. And it was a quite a spectacular sample. Here you have the cumulative mass. Here is the grain size, one to um, a thousand micron in diameter. And you can see this blue curve here shows the samples that I'm, I'm about to take here. And uh, you can see 70% of the mass was smaller than 63 micron in diameter, fine ash. And this fine ash can be suspended in air for, for days and travel all the way to Europe. Now, about the 10p uh, particles, or the less than 10 micrometer in diameter particles, there's about 22% of the mass. And then finally, the most dangerous uh, particles for your health is the less than three micron in diameters, and there's about 7% of the mass. So this, this mass is dangerous to your health, and these small particles, they can stay for a long time in your, 
in your um, lungs and in the worst case cause uh, lung cancer. You know, following events like this, uh, when the Icelandic Met Office is expecting a volcanic eruption, it contacts the the um, the uh, Volcanic Ash Advisory Center in, in London, and they start to run their um, global distribution model, climate models, and then they need information on the on the plume heights and grain size distribution, and then they start to run the models to um, then warn aviation authorities about the danger and define the air closure. And um, so around midnight, you know, here uh, April 15th, you know, large fraction of the European airspace was closed. And then with every day of grounding all these planes, the pressure increased to change the the reg uh, change the definition of air closure. Uh, in the beginning was any any as predicted, that airspace got closed. So, but after close to a week of 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 uh, airspace closure. The regulation was changed to uh, from any ash resulting in, in closure to some uh, tolerable concentration. And it was decided on the tolerable concentration was 2 milligrams per cubic meter. And this slide shows actually the old methods where there were any ash predicted to this new tolerable concentration. And as you can see that the airspace uh, closure actually shrunk and nearly allowing all of Western Europe just to, uh, to take off to everybody's uh, joy. Now, this is an interesting uh, similarity with, uh, uh, in general, the the AFR level closure is, um, I mean, this resulted in one week closure. You know, now in the con co current um, COVID situation, then we're talking about two months. So this is, a, you know, not comparable, but it was, as many of you can remember, this was a very significant uh, important, significant stuff. So back to science now. You know, this picture here shows uh, uh, hydromagmatic ash particle shown here. And, um, and uh, you know, with the help of the nanocenter in Copenhagen, we were able to define and, and study really the surface properties of the this hydromagmatic. And later there was a magmatic ash that came off after the the crater has built high enough walls to prevent water from flowing into it. So we are looking here on this page, these three pictures, we are looking at the area close close to here, where we have large particle surfaces and then small adhering particles. And you can see here, here are some adhering particles, and this is this is the the flat surfaces. And then what they've done here is is that they are able to to map out the adhesive force you know, how much adhesive force here. And you can see on the large particle, these three surfaces, there's a, there is a different properties of the surface. And also there's an, this is an elastic layer. And this is this volcanic, um, you know, fumes that are condensing on the surface of the ash. And uh, by doing, uh, combining the atomic force microscopy, XRF, BATS uh, unplug reactor experiments and surface area measurements, we were able to quantify the effect of of uh, of this adhesive adhesive or or, or uh, salt layer on the environment. The hydromagmatic ash particles were coated with about six nanometer thick salt layer. The magmatic ash particles that were formed later when the crater walls had built up here and prevented the water to get to the magma were coated with about four nanometer thick salt layers. The relative concentration of surface salts, especially proton salts like HCl and HF, was much lower on the hydromagmatic ash than the magmatic ash. The hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acids dissolved in the meltwater and were transported as solutes in the ensuing floodwaters. And you can actually see it here where the water goes in here. And we measured these uh, components in the floodwaters the 14th of, of May. Now, the hydromagmatic ash consumed H plus when exposed to pure water in experiments. So it's actually the pH was raised in a closed experiment up to pH 10. But the magmatic ash released H plus, so it's acidified the environment. The release rate of um, um, iron or phosphorus from the magmatic ash when exposed to waters 
were orders of magnitude faster than the one from the hydromagmatic gas. So the magmatic gas has greater potential to have cause local pollution and also in the ocean environment, uh, actually a significant fertilization potential. Uh, now in the end, I would like to uh, summarize the role of geochemists during these natural disasters. First of all, it's to measure gas fluxes before, during, and after the eruptions, quantify pollution, and finally, to gain fundamental understanding of the volcanoes. Thank you very much for your attention.